How do you transport power hundreds of miles across America's Southwest for millions of people? Today, we're with Quanta Services to find out. Welcome to SunZia, the largest renewable energy project in American history. Once completed, 916 best-in-class wind turbines built by Blattner, a Quanta operating company, will produce enough power for 3 million people, on par with the country's biggest power plants. But in this video, we're not covering the power generation itself. Rather, we're covering how they'll transport the future power from A to B. This is the challenge with any form of power. It's usually generated at large plants or wind farms like this one in rural areas. Then, using transmission infrastructure, the power must often travel long distances to cities for distribution. And in this case, the distance from A to B is 552 harsh desert miles. I have always wondered how transmission lines are built in the middle of nowhere, and now I have my answer. And I am way out of my element on this one because I think power is witchcraft. Hail science! But I am going to do my best to explain. Let's start where the power begins, at each wind turbine located throughout the enormous Sunzia project in central New Mexico. Produced by Vestas and GE Vernova, they feature three enormous blades creating a diameter of over 500 feet. Vestas turbines produce 4.5 megawatts of power, while GE turbines produce 3.6 megawatts of power for a total of 3,515 megawatts of power across the development. The power from the generator up top travels down the base and into the collections infrastructure. Collections are the cables connecting each turbine, allowing the farm to consolidate the energy. Over the project area, Blattner will bury 1,900 miles of underground cable connecting all of the dots. All this power will end up at what they call Sunzia East Converter Station in AC or alternating current. And this is great because all power grids in modern households are AC. But with over 500 miles between the power generation and its customers, it has a long way to travel. And while AC is great for everyday use, it's not as great for traveling over long distances. But DC, or direct current, is. Full disclosure, I did fail physics and circuits while in engineering school, so I am not the best person to talk to this, but here is the basic difference between AC and DC. Alternating current switches direction from negative to positive, then positive to negative, like a wave. This is the go-to for today's life as it can be stepped down, allowing for transmission across a grid into your home. Direct current flows in one direction continuously from negative to positive. This is the form of power batteries produce and electronics need to function, which is why you'll see small AC to DC converters on any of your phone, computer, or other device chargers. Why explain this? Well, during transmission, electricity is lost in the form of heat. The Miami Heat falls short here in the finals. And because AC alternates, it generates more heat and energy loss over long distances than DC. So while the wind turbines generate AC and the end users need AC, we must convert the AC to DC for transmission and then convert the DC back to AC for the sake of efficiency. Get it? Because I certainly did not at first. This brings me back to the Sunzia East Converter Station, which is also called a VSC or Voltage Source Converter Station. It's an enormous complex dedicated to transforming AC to DC using science and such. Hail science! Insulated gate bipolar transistors controlled by a pulse width modulation technique smooths the high frequency switching ripple. Or in normal people terms, 
The complex takes the AC wave, chops it into pieces, and smooths it all out into one uniform DC flow. From here, the DC hits the transmission line for its over 500 mile journey from New Mexico to Arizona. Once at its destination south of Phoenix, the Sunzia West converter station will reverse the process, converting the power back to AC for household consumption. Now for the transmission line itself. And before we talk construction, let's dive into the numbers. The transmission line is a single bipolar 525 kV line situated on a 200 foot right of way, which Quanta crews have access to for construction along the route. Crews are installing 2,162 support structures, ranging from 100 to 200 feet tall, to support the conductor lines depending on location. Space between 1,000 and 1,600 feet apart, they vary between guide mast, self-supporting steel lattice, and self-supporting tubular pole structures. The line will have 25.7 million linear feet of conductor and 140 million pounds of materials to make it happen. Everyone we talked to on site said this is the biggest transmission line job they've been a part of. And since it's so large, Quanta divided the line into three main segments, all under construction simultaneously. Now for how they've built it. Over 60% of the structures along the line are guide mast, with the smallest footprint of any structure at only one concrete base and four steel supporting wires. The entire structure is an erector set, arriving in boxes with on-site assembly. Foundation crews then dig a hole for each precast concrete base, which measures roughly five feet deep by 7.5 feet across at the bottom with only one foot exposed above grade. Crews then drill the four anchors into the earth equidistant apart at an angle and then grout each, making them one with the earth. Once they've tested each anchor to 82,000 pounds of force, it's time for the tower. A crane picks up the assembled tower and lowers the bottom onto the base with the crew pinning it in place. As this happens, other crew members secure each steel cable to the corresponding anchor point, perfectly balancing the tower. And like that, it's ready for wire. These towers are the majority because they're the most cost effective and generate the least impact. However, they only work in straight lines as they can only take perpendicular loading. So what happens when the line must turn? Well, that's when we meet self-supporting structures. Self-supporting structures are beefier and require no steel cables as the concrete foundation entirely supports them. Self-supported steel lattice structures are similar in build to the tension structures, but strong foundations anchor their forelegs to the ground. Similarly, self-supporting tubular structures are anchored by bolts to a concrete foundation. For both structures, contractors use large excavators to drill the giant shafts with augers, which are, on average, 3.5 feet in diameter and 23.5 feet deep. After the hole or holes are complete, Crews lower rebar cages into each, followed by concrete. This type of foundation is similar to many buildings and bridges. The strong foundation for both structures allows the transmission line to change directions and traverse longer distances, as the additional engineering counters the force applied in different directions to each tower. Installation of many of these towers is straightforward, with crews, trucks, and cranes able to access the work area via the right-of-way. But the Southwest ain't like Kansas. There's some harsh terrain from vast canyons to remote mountain ranges. And while exploring this terrain, we definitely had no vehicle trouble. That was changing the tire. Just basic dude stuff, you know. Yeah. Tire. Watching helicopters, changing that tires. <laughs> that, was, that was a lot. So how do they install these structures in the middle of nowhere when they can't access it with the crane? Yep, helicopters. This is where the video gets 
And not just any helicopters, but former military Blackhawk and Chinooks. With Blackhawks rated at about 9,000 pounds and Chinooks rated at about 25,000 pounds, these big birds had no problem lifting, carrying, and positioning the tower sections in the most remote areas of the project. As you can imagine, the coordination required for such work is intense with the air crew talking to and watching the ground crews non-stop. First, the helicopters picked up each pre-built tower section from a nearby laydown yard. Then, after flying the section to roughly where the tower is, the helicopters carefully positioned each section and awaiting crews tied off to the tower itself quickly secured each corner as the helicopter hovered above. Once secure, the tower crew removed the rigging and then the helicopter was off for the next piece. This work is pricey, with these helicopters costing tens of thousands of dollars an hour, so Quanta only used the heavy lift aircraft where needed in environmentally protected or hard to reach areas. But that's not the only helicopter work. Now it's time to string the conductor wire. With the towers on average 150 feet high, air support is the fastest and most cost-effective way to connect them with the transmission line itself. Using smaller, more nimble helicopters like the MD-500, pilots can carefully pull lighter guide wires into position on each tower, moving quickly in the right conditions. Then, ground crews can connect the guide wire to the conductor using a purpose-built cable puller to string the power line. After all the lines are in position, aerial linemen working from helicopters can place spacers and marker balls as needed. And we'd planned to see this work unfold during our recent visit to the project, but sadly the wind and weather conditions did not cooperate. However, the crew still offered to go up in the air for us, giving us just enough time to see some of the fun. I've never seen anything like it, and I cannot wait to see more soon. A huge thank you to Quanta Services and Pattern for having us out on this extraordinary project. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please subscribe because we have so much more coming, and we'll see you next time. Stay dirty.